morning, Europe. Uh, good evening here from Australia. Uh, my name is Nenya Liu. I'm the director of the Center for Environmental Law and uh, who will chair tonight's keynote session for the ACE uh, Frontiers Colloquium in Environmental Law. First, I uh, would like to pay uh, acknowledge the traditional owner of the Macquarie University land where my office is, uh, the, the Watamadagan clan of the Daru people, a Daru nation whose cultures and customers have nurtured and continue to nurture uh, this land. Uh, I sincerely pay uh, my respect to elders past, present and, and future. So tonight we are going to have, we are going to have three uh, distinguished speakers to talk, to talk to us about the decolonization and environmental law. Uh, before I, uh, I start introducing our first speaker, I would like to share with you uh, a little bit of my personal experience, and which you might be interested in knowing how did I get here and how did I, uh, how did I uh, kind of make this suggestion to my colleague Michelle and Paul to, 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 uh, to have the theme of decolonization and environmental law as, as the keynote panel theme? So in my first 23 years of life, uh, I was born and grew up in China, in, in rural China, as a male, as someone who uh, came from a, a lower middle class family, someone who comes from uh, the majority of the race of, of that country, I must say, I must say issues like race, gender, colonizations are all issues that are distant. Of course, you read those issues on the textbook, but you never ever pay attention to. It was really when I left China, traveled around the world, living in different societies, living and speaking English as, as my, uh, living, uh, living uh, and speaking English as my second language, and also to, uh, to, to become a, a part of the minority in different societies, that, that experience shaped me. And that experience pretty much gave me a, a new lens, a lens I would, I would never ever acquire if I would have chose a different pathway of my life. So this pretty much reminds me that everyone, when you are in a dominant position, there might be a blind spot. And this blind spot can hurt, as we know that we have, we have had thousands of international environmental agreements. We have had a, a comprehensive domestic environmental law in different countries, but the current environmental law, be it international or domestic, are not successful, are not successful, and it has not been able to, do, to, to successfully and effectively, effectively deal with the global, the profound global environmental crisis that we are facing today. So what are, what are the problems? There are many problems that we can't solve in this conference. But at least what we can contribute that from my perspective is maybe we can address some of those blind spots in the environmental law making for those people who are in charge that when in the future, when we are, develop, we are trying to develop better laws that will help. So colonization is being one of these kind of blind spots that I would say. Physically, we don't see that much colony, we don't see that much colonization today. I mean, after the decolonization uh, process, after the Second World War, now we have more than 190 sovereign states in different parts of the world. But the, the impact of the colonization is enduring. And it is still existing to a large extent because it now exists in a way of cultural and psychological that it really determines whose knowledge is privileged. So by having, and we are very fortunate tonight by having these three uh, different speakers, and we hope that these, th these three speakers who will present different perspectives on the challenges of the overcoming, uh, of the overcoming the legacy of colonizations in societal, institutional, and legal context that this kind of inspiration 
outside of the box of the environmental law community can provide some kind of inspiration for the environmental law community and also beyond the environmental law community here in Australia and New Zealand. So I will just stop here. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker tonight, Dr. Joe Ray from our Macquarie University. Uh, Dr. Joanne Ray is uh, a Daru Aboriginal community member. Uh, in 2019, she completed her doctoral thesis, The Country Tracking Voices, Daru Women's Perspectives on Presence, Places, and Practices at Macquarie University. So based on her research, she was invited to develop a first year undergraduate unit within the Macquarie University in the Indigenous Studies Center, uh, or actually department, uh, and also, he be she became a fellow, a research fellow with Macquarie University's Indigenous and Geographical uh, Geography Department in 2020. Uh, it is very exciting and probably it's very uh, kind of uh, uh, touching that in 2021, she and Star Women collectively were invited by the New South Wales Government Department of Planning, Industry and Environment to lead a women's cultural burn at Brown's Waterhole. Actually, it's not far, from, not far from my house. So this will be historic. This will be historic when undertaken because it will be the first time since the colonization that, that a Daru led women's cultural burn has been government approved and facilitated. My question, of course, is, and from as an outsider, is why it took so long. <laughs> now it's 2022. So, uh, uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Joe Ray uh, to give us uh, our first uh, uh, keynote uh, speech. Joe, the floor is yours. Thank you. Didgeridoo. Uh, Waramai and Didgeridoo. Uh, um, hello and thank you for attending this keynote address. I commence with a welcome to, da um, welcome to country in Darug language and take this opportunity to thank Andy, Karina, Norman, and the other Darug women for their tremendous work um, in restoring Darug language. So, Waramai Midiga, Bayawu, Bujari, Darug, Yurayin, Naya, Yurabarang, Ji, Darug, Wolomadigal, Yurayin, Bayawu, Bulbanga, Gananingang, Yura, Uragal, Yagi, Darabugu, Darug, Yura, Bayuru Niyini, Yanama, Ujwi, Tumadagu, Darug Nurawa, Nibadjiku, Didjuigu. So in English, I pay my respects to my elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge I speak from Gamarai Gunarangra and recognize my ancestral obligations to Wallamata, the Darug place and people of the Wallamai, the black snapperfish. It is Wallamata where Macquarie University is located. I acknowledge and pay my respects to all ancestors, Darug and other Indigenous elders, and all the scholars who have informed my journey. I welcome and thank everyone attending this very significant and timely forum, and acknowledge all the elders and ancestors' wisdom that you bring today. Additionally, I would like to thank Paul Govan and Michelle Lin and the team from Macquarie University uh, for the invitation and Aboriginal scholar Paul, uh, Professor Bronwyn Carlson, who has nurtured my academic journey since completing my doctoral candidature in 2019. This includes developing and teaching a direct centered unit here at Macquarie University. I thank her for recommending me for this task today. I have a couple of disclaimers. Straight up, I'm not a lawyer of any kind, and more specifically, I'm not an environmental lawyer. However, given this is an environmental law colloquium, my job today is to talk about First Nations law as best as I can, recognising it will always be limited by my own understandings and expressed according to my experiences of the elements underpinning the concept first law. As such, this addresses a synthesis from elders, both communal and scholastic. As such, I cannot and do not speak on behalf of others. So thank you to everyone. I rely on everyone's contribution for my own. The principal knowledge holders I will reference include the amazing work of Auntie and Dr. Mary Graham 
Okomba Meri and Wakawaka elder, Aunty Dilawara Lee, a Larakia elder of Northern Territory, Professor Eileen Morton Robinson, Dawn Power Woman of the Kwandamuka Nation, Professor Irene Watson of the Thuron Peoples, Professor Deborah Bird Rose, Doctor and Adjunct Professor Quentin Beresford, Professor Gary Lilienthal and Professor Naya Luden Ahmed, Professor jo uh, Joseph Pugliese, and Dr. Matthew Zilzestra and his colleagues. But foundationally, at the heart of my journey of the seven Darab women who provided their insights for my doctoral candidature and thesis and continue with their support today. So I'd just like to start with a quote. And um, this quote is something that I'd like you to keep in a corner of your mind as I will return to it at the end of uh, this address. So all that has been has changed and all that will be will change. It's how we manage the change, the changes that make the difference. This author is unknown, but um, I heard the first two lines of this when I was in my 20s. And over the years, I um, came up with the third line in terms of it's really the management of the changes that really is so critically important. So just keep that in mind till the end. So this address considers what the practical gap is between the dominating approaches of the last 234 years and those sustainable approaches of the last 65,000 years or more. In doing so, I hope to turn perspectives and practices towards sustainable futures. Firstly, I'd like to briefly position the context we find ourselves in today. The majority of my address is focused on what is today named the Australian continent and the Australian context. But as will be shown, given that much of the problem has originated from patriarchal human centricity across the colonized and urbanized domains, the place of urbanized degradation is critical to finding sustainable solutions globally. Secondly, I'll discuss what I've called in the title of this address, living law being the basis of Australian Aboriginal cultural practice, relationality and moral and ethical sustainable integrity. Thirdly, living law will then be contrasted with the law of more, more and more, which is the unsustainable mismanagement of the last 234 years on this continent. Finally, I will try to offer some ideas for consideration in an effort to overcome the gap between existing problematic practices amounting to serious mismanagement of country and how change towards sustainable futures may be considered. My responses will focus on urbanised settings, given that my area of belonging, obligation, caring and connection resides within Daragmura, also known as Sydney, Australia. So here we have a map, a global map of colonisation since 1500 to 2000. Um, notice the palest cream colour. This is not listed as colonised. Everywhere else is, with the British at light purple, French at green, Spanish at orange, Portuguese at dark brown, and Dutch at dark purple. So the problem for European-centric and Western mentalities that have driven and perpetuated colonisation is that they had no connection with the lands in which they arrived, whether it be Australia, America, Canada, South America or India, just to name a few. The intent of colonisation was not to care for country, only to take over and develop the place for the benefit of Western powers and reap the profits in the process. For Australia, it was the British empiricists. In the Australian context, this started on Daragmura, more commonly known as the majority of the Sydney Basin. However, like a rash, the takeover spread across the continent and with name changes at every step of the way, so-called Australia grew. 
along with the mismanagement of land and water resources, heroic narratives, greedy vested interests, and a de determination to suck every morsel out of the landscapes, country is now gasping for survival, just like the million fish gasped their last in the Murray-Darling Basin in 2019. The 2021 work of Dr. and Adjunct Professor Quentin Beresford articulates this history of mismanagement across the 234 years in his most recent book, Wounded Country, a contested history of the Murray-Darling Basin. What becomes extremely clear is the spiral of blindness, arrogance, greed, ignorance, and political shenanigans that is power-centric rather than country-centric and that continues and is an unsustainable system undermining the vast water system that around one quarter of the continent relies upon. However, while Beresford's work is extremely important because it focuses on the huge Murray-Darling Basin, a food bowl covering more than a million square kilometres that includes and crosses so-called four so-called Australian states, South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland, an area larger than France and Germany put together, it is only one part of the story that needs to be considered in the face of pending climatic catastrophes at our doorstep. So some statistics. Recent evidence from the Australian Conservation Foundation shows the deep link between human presence and other than human extinctions. Some of these extinct, uh, statistics um, from Ives et al. show that nearly 90% of Australia's human population lives in its towns and cities. Towns and cities in Australia are where 25% of the nationally listed threatened plants are located and 46% of threatened animals are located. So these urban statistics position the need for caring for country alongside rural and remote regions by reinforcing the impact and threat human-centric systems are having on other than humans. Further statistics from Ward and others show that across Australia, more than 7 million hectares of habitat have been destroyed by human beings. Pastoralism and land clearing has historically been the culprit. Given urbanisation is not simply an Australian issue, it is reasonable to recognise these imbalances can be globally extended. In the current climate challenging context, recognising human's central role in the demise of ecologies demands that we are central to the restitution processes. A short list of catastrophic destructions and extinction events relevant to this continent since 2018 include the largest living organism on the planet, the Great Barrier Reef, is under threat with frequent coral bleaching events. The megafires of the summer of 2019-2020 wiped out more than 10 million hectares, including suitable habitat for 69% of all plant species and 44% of Australia's threatened plants being burned out. And I'm quoting Gallagher here. Around a million fish died in the Murray-Darling Basin as a result of the contribution, sorry, of the uh, conditions of the river system. And today, just in the news today, the Parramatta River in Sydney um, is the site of um, more fish extinctions. And that's right in our Sydney area. And locally, the Hawkesbury Nepean River system, known as the Durabin to our Darug people, is under threat from the New South Wales State Government as they try to raise the Warragamba Dam wall against, against their World Heritage obligations, against Darug and neighbouring custodians' wishes, against renowned archaeological advice. And I quote Billy Chung, an elder there. Not to mention events like the melting of ice shelves and rising ocean levels. So this is the context for this continent and each continent will have its own rendition of the demise affecting planetary systems in their context. Combined, futures are looking grim, extinctions are looking inevitable, given that this demise on our continent has only commenced with colonisation 234 years ago 
it seems logical and fair to bring the voice of first peoples of this continent, our indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing that have sustained us for more than 65,000 years out from the icebox of marginalization that has nearly extinguished all the indigenous, human and other than human across the continent. The responsibility for the demise of this continent's ecologies, as Beresford shows, lay squarely at the feet of settler colonialism, a production underpinned by white patriarchal empiricism. The context today shouts to the fact that current events are causing land and environmental managers to question the dominant narratives, perspectives and priorities rendered as this continent's national identity. Understanding First Nations living law offers an opportunity to transform practices from perpetuating hierarchical disconnections for the purpose of increasing vested interests, power and wealth to sustainable systems of country connection and a worthy, legitimate national identity. So what is living law? Initially, I thought I would use Professor Irene Watson's term raw law um, within the title for today's address. As she points out, this term for, for the Aboriginal code of social and political conduct applies to when the formation of law was raw multi-millennia ago. However, many had their own ways of expressing Aboriginal law. Arnie and Dr. Mary Graham says law is the land, cultural practice and law is the foundation of relationality. The Rakia elder from the Northern Territory and International Grandmothers Committee representative, Billa Wara Lee, says Aboriginal law resides in the foundational understanding that all life found on Mother Earth is entwined in relationships and all life can be traced back to the forms and our dependencies, our responsibilities, obligations, connections, caring, and together builds our belonging. The land, she says, is my mother. Land is the starting point from where it all began. The land is our food, our culture, our spirit, and our identity. Aboriginal law and life originates in and is governed by the land. The connection to land gives Aboriginal people their identity and a sense of belonging. We believe everything has a spirit and that life is a continual spiritual, emotional, mental and physical journey which is constantly changing. And our journey is inseparable from Mother Earth. Professor Deborah uh, Bird-Rose informs us that a fundamental proposition in Indigenous law and society is that the living things of a country take care of their own. All living things are held to have an interest in the life of the country because their own life is dependent upon the life of their country. This inter interdependence leads to another fundamental proposition of Indigenous law. Those who destroy their country destroy themselves. And to be clear, our law certainly was a reality at the time of invasion, though it was unrecognised and denied, and colonisers constructed a fake narrative that we were without law, being uncivilised and without society. Professor Irene Watson reiterates it is still functioning today. So while many have different ways of expressing Aboriginal law, I've chosen the term living law because it takes the next step and recognises both its presence, its place, and its practice across eons, which always has and always will underpin sustainable, and I emphasise sustainable, social, political, and environmental existence. After all, more than 65,000 years of continuing Aboriginal civilization surely defines sustainability. And I use the term civilization in the true sense of the term, having a civil society, not a society that boasts its so-called developments. So living law, it's a web of relationality. As others noted, Aboriginal law is founded in relationality, recognizing life is an interweaving not a hierarchy. 
Living law is therefore a living relationality with presences, with places and with people. Together they make up mirror or country. I use the term presences for all forms having a presence, human, other than human, physical, metaphysical. So this web of um, living law is a web of active relationality. And it, re it is made up of all of these things, recognition, respect, equitable relationship, rights of humans and others, reciprocity, responsibility, and restitution. The purpose of any living relationship has to be and is sustainable well-being for the humans and the other than humans in that relationship. For sustainable well-being and relationship to live in any ecology involving human society, all seven elements in the web are required. Firstly, activated recognition and acceptance of the need for all of the web's other six elements. Secondly, respect respect for the presences, places, and sustainable practices of others. Thirdly, equitable relationship with the presences, places, and people of country. I think that's a, a, a challenging one for many. Rights, the rights of others, human and other than humans, that also is a challenge. Responsibility, and I know Paul was talking about responsibility at the very be beginning of the um, conference this morning, res responsibility in word and deed for honouring those relationships. Reciprocity in caring for and being cared by and through those relationships. We can't just keep taking, we have to give back. And when things aren't done correctly, restitution and res reparation are required. So based on this core, Therefore, logic dictates that sustainable country requires living law as an active and collective practice for sustainable custodial relationships. As such, just as happened for thousands of years, human collectives must be caring for country so country can care for us locally. This was and continues as custodial practice. Living law as custodial practice, even when country is a city. So this figure is adapted from my thesis, um, Country Tracking Voices, um, and um, Darug Women's Perspectives on Presences, Places and Practices, and arose from the findings of the doctoral research into custodial practice according to seven Darug women on Darug Mirror, that is in the city. And what was found was that living law as custodial practice involves connecting, caring, and belonging to the presences, the places, and the people. As such, it shows that even when country is a city, living law is being fostered through continuing custodial practice by Dara community. Through what Steele and others call quiet activism, connecting, caring and belonging to presences, humans and other than humans, places through cultural practices is being undertaken across several Darug sites. It shows that in order for a sense of belonging and a sense of caring for country, connecting over time and creating strong relationships with the presences and the places within country is required. This too is being undertaken through my undergraduate teaching at Macquarie University. However, current Western law imposed upon the continent since 1788 does not and cannot position equitable relationship as a caring for country practice because it fails to acknowledge its own illegality. As such, it dishonours the relationships it requires for sustainability. In this next section, I'll explain why. Decolonization. This is a term that um, Deborah Bird Rose used in 1999, and the current law of more, more, and more. Decolonization 
is underpinned by a system of cultural arrogance. Many have written about settler colonialism, including Pugliese, Beresford, Norton Robinson. Basically, it involves eight interwoven factors underpinned by cultural arrogance. Firstly, disconnection. As Rose put it in 1999, no ethic of connection or open dialogue. Secondly, racism as settler colonial practice and white supremacy, where natives were classed as needing to be civilized, thus the establishment of colonizing education systems. And my own great, great, great grandmother was put into one of these institutions as a um, nine-year-old. Patriarchal hierarchies of power as continuing settler colonial practice. Christian dogma perpetrating consumption of Earth's resources as God's will. We think of the Garden of Eden um, storing um, where everything was, was for the benefit of Adam and Eve. Possessed possession possesses and power agendas. Um, and Pugliese writes. Um, and quotes Kyle Powers White um, in 2020 and explains, settlers can only make a homeland by creating social institutions that physically carve their origin, religious and cultural nar narratives, social ways of life and political and economic systems, e.g. property, into the waters, the soils, air, and other environmental dimensions of territory or landscape. That is, settler ecologies have to be inscribed into indigenous ecologies. Thus, White concludes, settler colonialism can be interpreted as a form of environmental injustice that wrongfully interferes with and erases the sociological context required for Indigenous populations to be to experience the world as a place infused with responsibilities to humans, non-humans and ecosystems. And White wrote that in 2017. So the sixth point is how did this all of this empiricism um, become enforced? And it, firstly, it was enforced through fraudulent land title and false claims, concepts and narratives. To support this, I refer to the work of Professor Gary Lilienthal and Professor Nea Luden Army, who interrogate the legality of colonial seizure of undocumented lands through British allodial title, which was the functioning basis for land title at the time of colonization in Australia, in Britain. Their finding was, in Australia, the Crown had tried to introduce English custom in Australia as local law, but they did it by committing serious wrongs. This would nullify introduction of their legal maxims into Australia. Their claims to acquisition of a lodial title to Australian lands would thus be sufficiently defective as to reduce their holdings to mere colour of title. Their malafides in their attempts at land acquisition would defeat any claim to convert their colour of title into successful claim for adverse possession. Secondly, these fraudulent land title claims were deepened with a mania for ownership, development and progress narratives, political shenanigans underpinned by governments influenced by vested interests, and we're still tackling this one, and mismanagement of land and water resources. And, you know, the Murray-Darling Basin and Moragamba Dam are just two examples of that. The seventh point of deep colonisation was the Anglo-Western education for cultural conversion, which educates for the development, progress, consumption, driven human-centric systems by educating for jobs that support so-called heroic colonising histories rather than subjugation realities, more competitive education practices, structures and values, more engineering solutions rather than ecological solutions, more planning and urban development solutions rather than sustainable living solutions, more wealth and consumption through business, finance and Western economic mentalities, 
more status and power through competitive values, including globalizing marketing narratives and legal systems that support business as usual. And the eighth point of all of this is that it's all um, enforced and um, maintained through mass media and marketing networks. So altogether, the fiction of rightful sovereignty is a festering wound that denies the living law of sustainable relationality, which lies at the heart of the destruction and near extinctions of the indigene, indigene since 1788. Well may Beresford speak of the wounded country in the title of his 2021 work. So, sustainable futures and a certain wisdom making the turn. This isn't, I don't see this as a conclusion, but as a way forward, turning perspectives and practices towards sustainable futures. In the era of climate changing threats, perpetuating the current system is no longer tolerable. Short term thinking cannot sustain us. The sustainable futures we need fundamental change. I argue this change requires acceptance of living law for sustainable futures, governance based on grounded realities of relationality for sustainable futures, practices that create and establish situated and localised relationalities of connecting, caring, belonging to presences, places and people, and cultural change in societal places. I suggest three sites for these societal changes, workplaces, education places, and community places. How? Environmental law enacting living law needs to function from the ground up. Respect for the rights of other than humans, rights of the river, oceans, forests, flora and fauna. Cleaning up and empowering localities. Strengthening collective outcomes, not individualistic good. Working locally, you know, imagine what it would be like if we could all work within a, um, a bicycle ride from our work. Educating for local futures and local employment, caring for country locally. Education for sustainable futures. Strengthening the local connections to care for communities, especially in the cities changing the work narratives of for-profit to for sustainability, changing work narratives from bosses and workers to mentors and mentees, creating localised health and wellbeing from emphasis to succeed to emphasis on caring and belonging. So I ask you to um, keep in your mind um, this quote, stepping forward as remembering. Hopefully this address I have shown is not a coincidence that the problems we face are directly linked to breaking living law. It's no coincidence that the well-being of countries is integrally linked to the well-being of humans. When humans have no living law and no connection, they are incapable of living sustainable, sustainably. As Zilstra um, and colleagues have shown, connectedness is, at the, is, is a core conservation concern. And he called for this practice back in 2014. So let's remind ourselves of this quote. All that has been has changed. All that will be will change. It's how we manage the changes that makes the difference. Please take this with you for your consideration. Yanama Budri Gumada, walk with good spirit locally. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Adrian Ray. Uh, this is such a fascinating uh, and a beautiful presentation uh, from an uh, indigenous perspective on uh, decolonization and environmental law. So we will have a Q&A uh, session at the end of this panel. So uh, in the meantime, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to write uh, your question in the chat box or in the Q&A function, uh, and we will handle uh, at the end of three presentations. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor 
Mindy Chen, uh, which is the Dean of the Faculty of Law, University of Oxford. Mindy is one of the top contract lawyer in our world. So as I just say very briefly, uh, she holds a fractional professorship at National University of Singapore, visiting professorships at the University of Hong Kong, National University of Taiwan, Otago, Auckland, Canterbury, Göttingen, Tamasa, and Renmin University in Beijing. She is the author of the Contract Law, uh, seventh edition, published by to be published by OUP this year, and uh, she is now leading a six book project on the contract laws of sporting Asian jurisdictions, and of which three are published and four is in production. So, but. I must say, and I must introduce Mindy in a different way because how I got to know Mindy is not because of her top expertise in contract law or her role as the Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Oxford. Mindy is, is this, uh, how could I describe? Is this uh, massive, heartfelt, and so well needed uh, campaign on Twitter uh, called uh, Race Me Too. Uh, she launched this Race Me Too campaign uh, on Twitter, I believe, uh, at the beginning of this year, or uh, no, actually from last year. So that's how I got to know Mindy. And I must say, I'm, I'm one of the uh, one. Of, I'm one of the supporters of this very well needed campaign uh, on Twitter. So now it is my great pleasure and honor to, to, to uh, introduce Professor Mindy Chen to uh, deliver her presentation uh, from an institutional perspective on today's topic. So Mindy, the floor is yours, thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle and Nen Yi, uh, for inviting a humble contract lawyer to join your so much cooler environmental law community. Um, my job is to remind us that decolonization starts from our own institutions. So um, as you've been told, I started a Twitter campaign after a, a, a coincidence of events, three things that happened very closely together. Um, First, an incident of a very overt and frightening racist abuse directed at me and my three sons as we walked away from lunch somewhere. Um, and secondly, being challenged going into my own office. They didn't believe I was the dean and I needed to get into my own office. Um, and thirdly, the pro vice chancellor interviewed me as part of Oxford's increasing focus on race equality. And I thought, OK, then you say you care. Let's see if you will listen. So I tweeted between um, July and September, and I looked back and apparently over 2000 times, which is a bit frightening, uh, mostly recounting things that had happened to me without identifying any individuals. And I wanted to highlight systemic racism and unconscious bias. So, for example, I talked about the fact that when I first got my job at Oxford, I brought my children to show them around the garden of my college and an undergraduate tried to throw, throw us out as tourists um, because, you know, we weren't supposed to be there. And actually, an, a, a fellow academic threw us out of the hall, even after I explained uh, that I would be joining them as a, as a new colleague. Um, in a tutorial, the very first tutorial some years ago, when I critiqued the, the views of a white man, um, the student ascertained that I had no degrees from Oxford and, and said, I don't mean to be rude, but why are you teaching us? The answer is, I read, you should try it. Uh, at my first formal dinner, work dinner, the colleague next to me said it must be really hard having um, some young children. And I, and I took this to be an empathetic remark until he added, because you can't be a proper academic, can you? And then he, he followed that with, and you can't be a proper mother. And then he added that he, he himself would never immigrate uh, because immigrants never belong. So um, I took that rather hard in my first, <laughs> first social occasion of, of my new job. Um, when I forgot my library card and I asked to look at a reserve book saying I was faculty, I was told by the librarian, you don't look much like faculty. 
Um, I was walking my PhD student uh, out after a supervision, and he is uh, a Pakistani, and we stopped in the front quad to finish discussing a point, and a white tourist was taking photos, and she said to us, can you please move out of my picture, because I want to get an authentic shot of Oxford. Um, when I entered uh, a college to teach and brought a Supreme Court judge of an Asian jurisdiction with me, I was told that uh, tourists were not allowed. Um, and even yesterday, I was challenged going into a college, even though I was with the colleague whose college it was. So they didn't see her, they saw me and immediately jumped at me and said, uh, what are you doing here? So now the reach and impact of the hashtag really surprised me because I was just sitting in my office, you know, an armchair warrior tweeting away, but it prompted racialized minorities to share their experiences of race um, and express some relief that their hurtful and humiliating experiences uh, are being aired. But most of them wrote to me privately saying they were too frightened to share their stories publicly. For example, a black postdoc told me that her husband was so humiliated about being challenged going into her college that he thereafter refused to go and so she didn't participate in any of the social events. Um, the Korean wife of an academic uh, was again challenged and humiliated when she was trying to meet her husband in college and she never wanted to go into college and they left after two years. Kai Miller, the professor of creative writing, um, uh, wrote, uh, he's a black man, in the book, Things I Have Withheld. He said, on my first day in my present job, I arrived early. I am now a fully fledged professor. And so I was in my office so very early on my first day. It took me by surprise when the door began to jiggle, though it seemed to take the cleaning lady by much greater surprise to see me. She screamed and ran away. I shrugged and thought in time we would meet up officially and laugh at this. But soon the campus security arrived, burly men talking briskly into the walkie talkie. I had to present IDs and photographs just to explain the spectacle of my body in this space, to prove I had the right to be there and how our titles meant nothing in the moment in that moment, I was no longer um, a professor and the woman a cleaning lady. I was just a black man and she was a white woman and my presence terrified her. So I think the very first thing we need to do is enhance the training of support services so that racialized minorities are not constantly being made to feel that we don't belong, that we are objects of suspicion. I'm always told, of course, they're just doing their jobs. And my question is, why are they always especially good, so especially assiduous where racialized minorities are concerned? Now, of course, people never think that they're racist. They never intend to be racist. But when you're constantly on the receiving end of it, it's exhausting. A continual reminder that other people don't think you belong there. Now, when racialized minorities are treated as imposters, it's no wonder that so many of us have imposter syndrome. And I go back to Kai Miller. He says, I have grown so weary of intentions. I did not intend to be racist, they say to me all the time. He did not intend to be racist. If there's no intention, how can it be racist? They think the logic is so devastatingly simple and clear that it cannot be answered. But it is only that I have grown weary, as if one could say, it was an accident. I did not intend to push you to the ground so that the pain that you claim to feel shooting up your back cannot be real. It cannot be real because I did not intend it. So my second exhortation is that institutions really need to listen. They, have, they love to display people of color in their websites and glossy brochures as they loudly self-certify as anti-racist, yeah? But such color washing is just insulting when institutions don't want to listen to us. Um, those opposed to change often say, certainly in my neck of the woods, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But whether something is broke or not depends on who you ask you'll get different answers from the slave owner and as from the slave. The ax forgets what the tree remembers. 
So ask racialized minorities to share their experiences as students, as academics, researchers, staff. And it's really important that what comes back doesn't just go off into the ether, lost in the Indiana Jones warehouse at the end of the Raiders of the Lost Ark. There must be analysis and translation into uh, active responses. But in general, I have found that racial, racialized minorities have learned to be silent. And this includes quite senior people who've contacted me. And it included me before July. I've been an academic for 35 years. Now, why? Because raising issues are met with silencing strategies. For example, first, uh, I met with, well, we let you in, we gave you a job, you should be grateful. If you don't like it, go back where you came from. Um, secondly, you're successful, look, you're the dean. And that shows there's no discrimination, so, so just shut up. Thirdly, they say that what you, the thing that you're complaining of, you know, which happens to you constantly, has also happened to them once. The implication is they're white, so it can't be racism. Fourthly, uh, you're accused of being hypersensitive, angry, prickly, can't you take a joke? Fifthly, they provide a, a non-racial explanation for the behavior, anything but race. They individualize the experience and deny its structured or frequent nature. So it's really about you, it's not racism. Sixth, they say my black, Asian, mixed race, friends, partner, kin, colleague, neighbor, children, grandchildren, they don't think it's racist. Seventhly, they accuse you of being sexist, homophobic, transphobic, intolerant, bigot, bully, harasser. Um, eighthly, they change the conversation. They highlight any mistakes you've made, however minor or irrelevant, and make that the issue. And ninthly, they say, hey, we're the good guys. You're being over the top. And it reminded me that Martin Luther King expressed his frustration um, at the liberal response to his activism. You know, they say, we support you, but you're doing it the wrong way. If you want our help, don't make us feel bad. And, and this coincided with a, a, a recent um, conversation with a friend. She said to me, oh, she was listening to a black woman talk about racism, and she was so extreme. She said, it would make you want to join the KKK. And I was really shocked. I said, nothing should make you want to do that. And she doubled down. And I said, oh, gosh, I was really surprised. And I said, oh, I think I've learned this off Twitter from my Twitter friends. And I think it's called white fragility. And she got even more cross. <laughs> she, and, and I said, oh, oh, and I think it's called white woman's tears. Well, that didn't help. She was furious. And I said to her, well, it's really interesting how angry you are about this. We didn't speak for some time. So I would say, please listen to racialized minorities with humility, without rationalizing, excusing, avoiding, defending, blaming, punish, punishing, or gaslighting. The second reason for the silence of racialized minorities is in the idea of stereotype threat. So the idea is that people are likely to perform poorly when they feel threatened or undermined. A person is, who is aware of the negative stereotypes about intelligence or ability of a group to which they belong feels threatened and they worry that performing poorly will simply confirm the stereotype and that in turn undermines their performance. There's a lot of literature on African-American students in the US, on uh, women, on the elderly, on low socioeconomic status um, students. So stereotype threat produces a marked physiological response. A person doesn't have to believe in the stereotype to be um, badly affected by it because it reduces your self-concept and your self-esteem it lowers your performance expectancy. It induces negative thinking. I'm not good enough, so I need to do more work. It triggers um, alienation, dejection. And this itself triggers a self-protective defenses that consume cognitive uh, resources. And that interferes with working memory. It creates cognitive interference and impairs performance. So it's like you're trying to multitask. Um, Stereotype threat responds to social constructs that produce our unconscious biases. These are our instinctive 
automatic responses to others based on deeply ingrained beliefs, family values, cultures, and life experiences. They're absorbed by children before school age from the family, um, from the media. I remember when my son was five, he, he said, mummies don't know as much as daddies. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Why is that? And he said, daddies go to work and mummies stay at home. And I had to say to him, where do you and daddy take me every weekday? To work, he said. And I said, and what does daddy do? Oh, he stays at home with us. So you can see that it trumps their lived experiences. And they found that even women and racialized minorities exhibit biases against women and racialized minorities. I told a white colleague that I always feel I have to be well prepared for conference talks because I always start with a credibility gap. I always have to prove why I'm talking. And he said, huh, it's interesting. It never occurs to me that I won't be good enough. Um, in his memoir, Long Walk to Freedom, Nelson Mandela tells of boarding an Ethiopian Air Airways flight in his early days. Because he had never seen a black pilot before, he had to suppress a panic that arose within him. How could a black man fly an airplane, he asked himself, right? So it goes really deep, you know? And if Nelson Mandela has unconscious bias, we all do. Yeah, perhaps if I met a Taiwanese woman educated in New Zealand who purports to be an Oxford professor and Dean of the law faculty, I would be very dubious. So we need allies. We need to uh, allies to drive systemic improvements to workplace policies, to fight injustice and to promote equality through validation, you know, to say, I see you, I hear you, I respect you, I acknowledge your hurt. Um, and that happened to me for the first time, you know, I, because of the Twitter campaign I, that I found really moving, you know, who said, I'm listening and reflecting and learning and wanting to be part of the change. That said, I hope to honor your generosity in sharing your experiences by working harder, never to marginalize my colleagues and to always intervene if I see, hear, or read racism in professional contexts. Allies pay attention to how minorities experience meetings and other gatherings, and they stay alert to uh, inequities and disparities. Allies consider their own behavior, their own privilege, and use it as a platform for good. So it shouldn't have to happen to you for it to matter to you. There's no need for great malice to do great harm. The absence of empathy and understanding is enough. Silence and complacency in situations of injustice makes you complicit. The standard institutional response to mentions of racism is a declaration by the institution that they're anti-racist. And they say, oh, we have a robust uh, complaints procedure. Now, complaints procedures are necessary, but they're not remotely enough. And this is the third reason for the silence of racialized minorities. Accusing someone of racism is like accusing them of being a pedophile. Absolute nuclear war breaks out and the accused will fight to the death. The complainant is cast, uh, is cast as the problem. They're the troublemaker and they're frozen out. There's a huge emotional and personal cost to raising these. You're damaged to your reputation, your future prospects, oh, she's troublesome, and um, you become socially alienated. So we need to find a way for people to raise problems without triggering nuclear war. We need to signal from the very top, from the leadership, the importance of diversity and inclusion and keep going, keep doing so because it gives others in the institution a mandate to pursue certain policies or to do things in one way rather than another. We need to allocate proper resources to it and we need to put E&D representation on appointments panels. This is important not just to race, but to all protected characteristics. When we come to selecting for excellence in research, in appointments, we have a tendency to reproduce after our own kind. We can't help it. It's instinctive. We lean towards people who look, dress, speak, have similar backgrounds, mannerisms, sense of humor to us, and we lean in the way from those who are quite different. Those in gatekeeping positions 
value the type of research they recognize that they did themselves that engage with their interpretations and agenda that keeps them relevant and the top dogs. They devalue, marginalize and silence different voices. When I started my Asian contract law research in 2012, um, I got very discouraged by senior academics. Why are you bothering? They said, it won't do anything for your career. And what would you learn anyway, right? And when I said I was applying from, for research funding, um, I got sneers. You think that people are gonna give you money for that, you know? Um, but at a UNIS conference where someone was advocating some, what he thought was his brilliant genius, I put my hand up and said, you know, did you, did you talk about Japanese law? Because, you know, Japanese law is, has, is what you are suggesting and it's been what you are suggesting for over a hundred years. So is Korean law, so is Thai law, you know, let's not reinvent the wheel. If you knew what was going on, you, you, you wouldn't be uh, reinventing the wheel. So I just wanna finish with asking, what does it take to thrive in academia? First, you need to be creative and persuasive. And for that, we need confidence, self-belief, a sense that my views matter, right? But secondly, and crucially, we need acceptance and recognition as being excellent, of having a presence, of being acknowledged by others in the relevant community, so that you feel that you have something to say and that others will give you the time of day. So we need, we need you. Racialized minorities have long had to edit themselves to be acceptable, to be heard, to be recognized, to be given some of the goodies from the table. Lewis Hamilton recently said, um, the entry point to my sport, uh, F1 driving, was a square and I was a hexagon. And I thought I'm not, never going to get through that bloody thing. So I had to morph myself way in. And then I go back to the shape I was before. So racialized minorities are often not admitted to the social circles of belonging, of colleagues asking for your views, of taking what you say seriously, asking you to join the football, the drinks, the coffee, the dinner, stopping to have a chat, giving you eye contact or a nod of acknowledgement as recognition of belonging. Um, failure to do these things is racism by omission. As Eli Wiesel said, uh, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. We all have unconscious bias. To deny it is an oxymoron. Um, we need to transcend our own subjectivity and to the enter the world of others. Diversity is not a zero sum game. Like the gene pool, diversity strengthens us, not the least to meet uh, future challenges in living sustainably with our environment. That's me, thank you. Thank you so much, Mindy. Uh, I'm so touched by your, I mean, I think every sentence, which is every sentence that you said, uh, I just kept nodding my head because I, I, I pretty much fully, not just agree with that, but I think I have experienced every single thing that you have just described. So, <laughs> and when it comes to, when it comes to environmental law, what I would like to say is like, diversity is not a charity. Diversity in the decision making is probably one of the one of the key factors for a successful lawmaking to tackle tackle the problems for for all of us. I mean, when it comes to the environmental challenge, uh, the global warming and massive biodiversity loss, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter the race. It's coming to every single person's doorstep now these days. So we do really need a very uh, diversified voices in those uh, decision-making process to make better environmental law, be it domestically uh, uh, or internationally. So I, but it really starts from home or from our workplace as, as both Joe and Mindy suggested, like it's actually start from our home base rather than somewhere far away. So it's, people always, it's easier for people to support somewhere something happened far away, but when it comes to your own workplace, then it's something else. So um, thank you so much again, Mindy, for your time for, for this very uh, touching uh, talk. So now our, our next speaker is, and last speaker of the panel is uh, Dr. Dina Lupin. 
uh, Dina is the uh, director of the Global Network on Human Rights and the Environment. Uh, she's a legal theorist uh, working in feminist, queer, and decolonial philosophy. I believe now you are working at actually the Department of Philosophy of uh, University of Vienna, right? So, so even though uh, you are in the uh, in the legal sphere, and I think you are you are that type of lawyer that we very much need about thinking deeply in philosophy. So, uh, and also, by the way, the Global Network for Human Rights and the Environment, uh, uh, our, our own programming is its Asia Pacific Director, and so the, the, the network is also co-supporting uh, of this uh, Frontiers Conference. So, or without being further being introduced, Dina, so uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Um, first, um, just a quick word of thanks to all the organizers of this fantastic event. Um, it's really uh, a great privilege to be part of this panel. It's a little bit intimidating to follow those two extraordinary talks. Um, thanks to Paul and Michelle and Sarah for all the organization and, and just having me be a part of this. It's very exciting. And I think my presentation in some ways is, is gonna feel very different to the two preceding presentations, but I, but I actually wanna suggest that it brings together some of the themes that, that the previous presenters have talked about. And certainly I think um, it brings together kind of issues of indigeneity and environmental governance, and maybe some of the practices of silencing and marginalization and exclusion um, that, that Mindy's just been talking about. Um, at, least, at least I hope it, it does that. Um, when Paul wrote to me about participating in this panel, he, he suggested that we look at the connections between the notion of responsibility, decoloniality and environmental law. Um, and I'm gonna try and do that sort of through a, a justice perspective. But before I do that, um, I want to just um, show you this map and, and talk a little bit about the, the sort of legal and jurisdictional context that I come from, which is South Africa and, and the practices of consultation that happen there. This is a map of Mpumalanga, which is a province in South Africa in the, um, in the Northeast. Mpumalanga, as you can see, borders with Mozambique and, um, and Eswatini. Um, and, and what you see in this map, the purple are mining rights that have been granted, mining that's happening, and the red is prospecting applications. This map is actually out of date. It's, it's nearly a decade old, I think. Um, and the situation today is actually much worse, over 60% of um, the land in Mpumalanga is subject to mining and prospecting license applications at the moment. Um, Mpumalanga is in many ways the food basket of South Africa. It's, it's a very um, rich um, uh, area for, for, for agriculture, but it's also an area in which many uh, indigenous South African communities live on the land, um, have many practice subsistence farming um, and have long standing uh, rights and connections to land through um, traditional customary African um, land rights. And so um, they, they connect to their environments, not only uh, through, through practices of farming and grazing, uh, animal grazing, but, but also uh, their communities express sort of very profound um, cultural and spiritual connections to the environment and to the land. Um, and for indigenous and traditional communities in Mpumalanga, who I should say their rights to land have been a kind of very radically diminished and diluted by uh, centuries of colonization uh, and then apartheid and uh, more recently um, corruption. The only really meaningful avenue that they have to protect themselves and their land and their spiritual practices and their environments and their communities is through the right to consultation. The right to consultation is entrenched in South African law and in the South African constitution as a mark of a society that um, no longer subjects people to random and racist laws, no longer subjects people to systems of governance in which they have no say, which were kind of the, some of the defining features of the apartheid state. But today, the right to consultation is really the last line of defense, one of the very few legal tools that 
communities have to resist a growing development and uh, extractive industries agenda that forces communities from their land, that destroys their environments, and that largely entrenches their poverty. But while consultation is a right, and one that was hard won in South Africa, it is also an incredible burden. In order to partake in consultation processes, communities must take on substantial commitments of work and time. They have to commit enormous amounts of resources they often do not have. And um, this is because participation in consultation isn't just a matter of kind of attending a meeting where you get to talk to a decision maker and have input into some uh, law or administrative making process. It involves huge amounts of preparation and often first starts with internal negotiations within the community, necessitating many rounds of, of meetings. And while some communities have well-established decision-making processes and political structures, others don't, or their structures have been torn apart, uh, either by colonial or apartheid rule, or sometimes by the very mining application itself. It can, it can render communities in two. Um, and so sometimes communities must organize or reorganize or reconstitute themselves in response to a need to engage in a consultation process. In South Africa, consultation must be informed. And the primary way that mining companies like to inform communities is by leaving piles of files of dense documentation at the nearest library or municipal office. Um, which need not be very near at all. Sometimes it's a great distance from the community. Mining companies also often offer to make it available online on request to communities who rarely have any electricity in their houses, often have no running water, who access internet on their phones, when they can afford to pay for the overpriced data bundles that are just another part of a South African economic system that increasingly seems to be designed to bring the poor to their knees. Having access to this information and all of this legal documentation that's kind of foisted on them in an uh, ostensible effort to ensure they are informed, um, they, they then have to digest it and understand it, and there's no provision in the law to provide affected communities with any kind of support, with any kind of scientific support, with any legal support, with any financial support, or any other kind of support. So communities in which literacy levels are often very low. This is a part of the country where at least 10% of the population gets no formal education at all. They must then navigate these files of air impact reports and water impact reports and, and legal compliance data. And they have to do it pretty much on their own, which of course is not something that mining company CEOs do. They navigate this information with the help of teams of lawyers and, uh, and scientific consultants. But of course, communities not only need to consume and understand the information they're provided, they also must respond to it. That's the point of consultation. They have to respond to the claims made by environmental impact and social impact assessors who are employed by and paid by the mining company who claim that the creation of a vast open cast coal mine or the rerouting of a precious river or the storage of toxic industrial waste or the excavation of ancestral graves or the forced removal of homes or the drainage of wetlands or the destruction of grazing and farmland or the complete devastation of plant and animal habitats. And I've seen all of these listed and described in environmental impact assessments as impacts that can be rehabilitated in 20 or 50 years or whenever the mining stops or that they're manageable through the creation, they can be offset through the creation of a protected area or an artificial wetland in a different part of the country. So communities have to respond to these claims about their environments, their land, their homes, their ancestors, their well being, their lifestyles, these claims about them that are then used against them, they have to kind of respond to them. And they do. Community organizers and activists work tirelessly to respond to these, report, these reports and to document the ways in which they have often already suffered at the hands of the mine. They travel from household to household, often across huge distances, gathering stories and information, calling on community members to detail the enormous 
social, environmental, and economic impact that mining has. They consult elders, they consult ancestors, they write down the names of objectors, they detail the way they live with and on their land, they write about their environments. And then they take this information, which they normally would be reluctant to share with antagonistic mine company representatives and indifferent government bureaucrats, they take this information and they attend a consultation meeting. But consultation meetings are really organized in a way that suits the lifestyles and schedules and ways of speaking of many community members. They take place at awkward times in locations very far from where the community lives. The community will organize and pay for transport. They'll take leave from their jobs. They'll get up at four o'clock in the morning to travel and attend this meeting. And they're expected to travel sometimes great distances to engage in meetings that then often amount to little more than endless, tedious PowerPoint presentations, not in a language the community speaks, by some mining company PR employee. The community is then given limited time to speak. They're told how they can speak. They're told the language they're allowed to speak in. They have to speak one at a time. They often are cut off because of time considerations. They're told that the issues they're raising when they talk about their spiritual connections to the land or the connection to colonialism or apartheid, they're told that none of that is relevant to the subject of the meeting. Those comments that they make are, that are then deemed by the person who's organizing the meeting to be relevant to the impact assessment are then compiled in a report, which is connected to the impact assessment, which is connected to the license application, which is then submitted to a government decision maker. So all of it is compiled in support essentially of a license application. Communities very rarely get to see these meeting reports and all the ones that I have seen include hardly any information from the discussion in the meeting. They usually only list the people who attended um, as some kind of evidence of a consultation process. And this, I should say, is an account of the good cases. These are cases in which consultation actually happens. In most cases, these communities wake up one morning to find mine excavation equipment in their front yards without any consultation having taken place. And then their only option is to like try and find allies, public interest lawyers, interested journalists, pro bono scientists, who will help them as they become embroiled in what inevitably become lengthy battles, legal battles, court battles, simply to try and get mining companies and the state to comply with their most basic obligations under law to include people in decisions that affect them. As you can see from that dense map of applications, communities face multiple projects. And within each project, they face multiple applications and legal processes. So they have to navigate a whole process around water use license applications and environmental authorizations and mining authorizations. Um, and in addition, no sooner has one consultation process ended and another begins as another company looks to prospect or mine or build a road. Um, so communities are beset by license applications and these processes unfold over months and years. They often have to appoint a particular community member who will take on the job of dedicating all of their time to this without funding or support of any kind. There is, I have to emphasize, no support in the law for these communities, no funding, no advisory services, no money to pay communities for their time and their labor, for their expertise, for the assistance that they give to making decisions about how land should be used in this country. The whole exhausting, demanding, burdensome process is seen as their right for their own good and so compensating them never crosses the mind of a mining company employee or a state bureaucrat. So why do it? Well, the cost of failing to participate is devastatingly high. Where one has the opportunity to participate, but one does not, one's consultation is essentially taken as community consent. You consent to the mining when you don't participate. You consent to your own forced removal. You consent to the radical far reaching devastation of your land and your fragile environment. This is the situation in South Africa. I know the details differ quite significantly, but as many indigenous activists 
um, have, have pointed out, this burden of consultation is much the same in many other parts of the world. Um, so I'm probably more than halfway through my time and you might be wondering why I'm talking about this when the theme of my talk is about the relationship between responsibility and decolonization in environmental law. Well, the reason is that as moral philosophers have pointed out for a long time, one of the things that's so kind of interesting about the idea of responsibility is that it has these different dimensions and these different applications. For example, we can take responsibility or we can be held responsible for some act or misconduct. In this case, responsibility is backward looking, concerned with accountability or blameworthiness for some past action. But one can also be responsible for or to someone. Responsibility can be forward looking. I am and feel responsible for my child. It's a responsibility I connect to love and care rather than blameworthiness. Um, indigenous scholars like uh, Carl White, who Joe spoke about earlier, have also pointed to responsibility as being about um, agency and, and epistemic authority in indigenous communities. In the context of a lot of environmental scholarship that, that, I'm, that I've kind of been reading, though much of the focus has been on recognizing human responsibilities to the environment. And responsibility in this context is often contrasted with rights, where rights are seen as demands we make on the world, um, which are well established and, and recognized in law, while our responsibilities often go unacknowledged and unlegislated. So there's a tendency to think maybe that we don't have responsibilities to the environment. But in fact, these environmental scholars have argued we ought to recognize both our responsibilities for past harm to the environment and our duties to the environment beyond our anthropocentric interests in it. But what I hope to highlight in um, my discussion of the burdens of consultation is the fact that the idea of responsibility can have a dark side. This is because responsibility can not only be taken or given, it can also be shirked. We can shirk both our backward looking and our forward looking responsibilities. We can refuse to be held responsible for things we've done, or we can refuse to take responsibility to those to whom we have duties and obligations. And in some contexts, and I would argue, especially in the context of environmental harm, when the responsible party shirks their responsibility, that responsibility is shifted onto someone else. Just as the benefits of environmental harm are not evenly or justly distributed across our societies, the burdens of environmental responsibility are also not justly distributed. These burdens are increasingly laid across the shoulders of indigenous forest dwelling and rural communities, of women, of children, of those with the least capacity to bear them. Those who've done nothing wrong are held responsible for centuries of environmental disregard. Those with less than nothing to give are weighed down with duties and obligations of environmental care and repair. And I believe that the right to consultation has increasingly become a means of shifting responsibility from those who shirk it, namely states and industry, mining and energy companies in my example, onto impoverished communities, marginalized communities, who stand to lose the most from industrial development of the kind we see in that Mpumalanga map I showed you. The right to consultation has been integrated into the process of license application decision-making in such a way that the mining company has the task of arguing for mining. They have some legal obligations to establish that the mining won't result in known or foreseeable harm that cannot be rehabilitated or offset. But their job here is not one of responsibility or care for the environment. Equally, as the decision maker, the state positions itself as an adjudicator be between what becomes articulated as competing social interests. The state's not a participant with a responsibility to the environment or to the community with a duty to protect. Since the state's a decision maker in these cases, it's excused from having a voice in the supposed debate between the alleged economic benefits of mining and the undeniable harm that mining wreaks. The state shirks its social and environmental responsibility. As a licensed applicant with shareholders and contribution to GDP to worry about, the company 
also shirks its responsibility. And as a result, the responsibility shifts. The job of providing an alternative narrative to the mining company or to resisting biased scientific accounts of arguing for preserving and protecting the environment, of arguing for the protection of the community and its members and its traditions falls to the community itself. The right to consultation has been transformed into a responsibility of consultation and a responsibility of care for the environment. And as I've argued, this responsibility is a heavy burden. It's a heavy burden for anyone, but it's been laid in the laps of the very communities who've been denied the resources, the support, the finance, the protections they need to carry these burdens. So my point, I think ultimately is maybe, uh, quite a sort of narrow and obvious one, but I think we need to pay attention to responsibilities in environmental law and governance. I think we need to pay attention to our backward looking blameworthiness and our forward looking obligations to the environment. But in the neo-colonial, neo-apartheid realities of our societies and not just South Africa, but most of our societies, we need to understand our responsibilities and who bears them through a justice lens. And that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dina. This is also uh, a very kind of concrete uh, example that you uh, presented uh, in South Africa. But as you said, which is very well true, is like it's not just South Africa. It's actually in many uh, societies that we could find this kind of a neoliberalism, neoliberalized responsibility of consultation issues. So we have uh, about 15, 17 minutes left after three um, breathtaking <laughs> presentations. And I, I myself thoroughly enjoyed all your presentations. So now, is there any question from the panelists uh, and also the uh, attendees? So I, I see there is a specific question uh, from Angela uh, towards, towards Dina regarding that proposed am amendment to the section 40, 43 of the NEMA. Uh, so Dina, do you want to touch upon that? Do, uh, can you read that question or do you want me to read it for you? Uh, that it's quite a long uh, description of uh, Angela, I think Angela is also from uh, South Africa, so <laughs> apparently this, she's very familiar with, with what's going on. Do you want to quickly touch upon uh, your this question? What, well, Angela's question points to, to a kind of current controversy. Um, the, there's, there's been a proposal to change the law that um, essentially, um, so one of the things that's very progressive about the South African system is that civil society uh, has great standing to um, to bring cases and to and to often be a voice for the for the uh, for, for marginalised and rural communities. Um, and a recent amendment to the law essentially um, uh, seems to remove their standing to do that in respect of certain appeals of decisions. Um, I think that's that's what you're referring to, Angela. Um, and I think, I think, I think this sort of connects to what I'm talking about in, in a different way. So a lot of my research and work looks at the ways in which, um, the, the ways in which communities, indigenous communities, particularly, but also queer communities, community women, lots of different kinds of marginalized communities get silenced through processes that ostensibly give them a voice. Um, so, so processes of consultation, processes of, um, of administrative appeal, um, these are processes um, through which people are, they, they seem to be given a voice, but in fact, then their voice is, is, is silenced, it's kind of disappeared. Or, you know, as I said in this talk, they're, they're, they're kind of given a, a burden of, of, the burden of participation is so high that it becomes almost impossible. Um, and in a way, this is this amendment is a kind of much more explicit silencing, and it's a pattern we're seeing in many countries in the world of of just sort of um, pushing civil society 
um, who, who often are the advocates for the, for the most marginalized out of processes of decision-making. Um, and, I, and I think it's, so my thoughts on the amendment is that it's, it's terrible, but in some ways it makes explicit what's, what I think has been a, a pattern of silencing um, in environmental decision-making in South Africa and in many countries for some time. Yes, thank you, Dina. Uh, next question comes from uh, Dr. Sridi Watini from uh, University of Islam, Indonesia. Uh, yeah, Sridi has been a very active participant in this conference. And uh, uh, he, her question reminds me of what I recently uh, read about this, this. I don't know if anyone heard about the solar punk. Like, uh, pretty much, I, I feel like her question is really, if, if I may, to interpret this question, is like, it's pretty much like the future looking of the, in, 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 of the environmental law, international and domestic. It's like, when we have achieved the decolonization, what would the international environmental law look like? What would the environmental law look like? Uh, and would this kind of environmental law be more kind of a justice? I guess so. And also, especially to, uh, to kind of fill the gap between the north and the south and also the intergenerational uh, kind of gap um yeah i don't know any panelist wants to joe maybe or dina do you want to share any thoughts on that what, what what would it look like i think that's kind of a very much a future looking vision like what, what do you see the future of the world <laughs> when we have achieved the decolonization. I, I think that would be very exciting. I was like, no. I'll, start, I'll start just by apologizing because my camera and the screen on my computer is black. And so I've only got my big screen functioning. So that's why I'm looking this way rather than to a black screen there. I'll try and move backwards and forwards for you. But, um, well, this was, this was, what I was trying to look at in terms of um, what can be done um, in terms of not putting the burden. Well, responsibility is a burden when it is when it is enforced through, um, as Dina pointed out, um, through a bureaucratic tech, um, tactic basically, um, tactics are being used, my understanding is um, to, uh, to silence and um, it's not accidental, it's intentful, it's full of intent. As such, the question then in terms of law is how do we um, remove the malice that is underpinning the desire for mining to and profit and this and this is why um, we have to look to changing laws that allow the dominating bureaucracies and i call them the possessed possessors because they just want to own everything ownership is is the underpinning mentality certainly in Australia and colonialism here is all about um, owning resources, owning land, owning profit, owning um, human beings, owning the workers. So, so the concept of altering the law so that there is a more balanced approach to um, protecting um, people's rights to um, have a voice and a participation in the society that is equitable. So if you're going to have an equitable voice, you've got to have equ equitable resources. And that's, I think, one of the key things that came um, from uh, Dina's talk was that um, there's no equitable relationship. So on that living law, web you know that that i i presented in my speech equitable law is balanced against respect if you don't have respect you're not going to get equity are you so if you're not going to have equitable relationships 
with others uh, of whichever um, diversity, whether they're human or other than humans, then respect can't be provided. And if you don't have respect, um, you can't have um, a responsibility to the other. And if you don't have a responsibility to the other, you can't have reciprocity. So that's why that web is full of all these dimensions that, that enact it. And, and nothing can be left out because if anything gets left out, the whole thing unravels. And so um, bringing back the notion of what it is to have a relationship, an equitable relationship, a respectful relationship, one that involves other than humans as well as humans' rights. This is the problem that we've always had, you know, um, since colonisation, was the disrespect, the inequities. All, the, the, all those words can have their opposites, you know, um, and no restitution. So for the people who are having everything stolen from them, um, whether it's through mining, or, or um, false law systems that have been implanted. Other countries are in a different situation, but Australia has no treaty. We've never ceded our country. And as such, the whole legal system, as um, Lillian Fowl and Ahmed point out, it's, it's false. It's based on false premise. It disobeyed its own law in terms of the British when it came. And the whole narratives have been based around a false legality. And it's never been um, accepted. And, and of course, you know, violence, settler colonial violence um, against the peoples, settler colonial violence against the landscapes, settler colonial violence against the rivers, the forests, you know, everything, even today, as I said, you know, the toxicity in the waters. When I was young, we could swim in these waters. Now they're completely polluted. That's because they're disrespected. That's because there's no possibility for restitution by the rivers, you know, to those people that have been um, creating all the toxicities. So until that balance is reframed, and this is where the, the role of environmental lawyers is absolutely, is absolutely critical to actually um, pull apart where the inequities are, pull apart where the, um, the, the lack of relationship, the lack of respect, and transform those. Because ultimately, unless the narrative changes to sustainability, the globe, the planet, is in deep, has deep problems, you know, human beings as well. The imbalances are already being felt. The mega fires that we've had here in Australia, I'm not sure what goes on for, for Africa or, um, you know, other continents. And certainly we hear it. We hear a lot about what the fires going on in America, for example. But these imbalances and, um, are completely able to be dealt with if we return to, and uh, this is my, my argument, that um, if we turn, return to localised relationship, going down to our local forests, our local places of caring and actually spending time connecting with them. This is, this is what I teach to the students, non majority of non-Indigenous students, that we need to reform our connections to the country, our connections to the presences there. And actually it's only by connecting that we can actually create a relationship and actually begin to care. So um, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mindy? Well, I've got a couple of points. Thank you, um, 
uh, Sri Watini, for your excellent question. I, I, I often think law, like money and religion and the big things that, that determine the way the world is, they're human constructs, right? If we don't believe in, they don't exist anymore. But the environment is different, right? You can't, uh, you, it won't bend to our will. It won't bend to our, our invention, our construction of it. So we have to listen to different voices um, of people who are actually on the ground in um, the particular environments that there are in the world. Um, and, you know, I, I, I remember advancing an idea when I first got to Oxford and someone just, you know, put their nose up at me and said, well, I'm not convinced. And I thought, well, what kind of an argument is that, right? That's the argument of somebody who's incredibly superior and says, you just have to match my, you have to impress me. And I said, why are you not convinced? And he said, oh, my nose tells me so. And I said, oh, the olfactory test. I mean, really? And I just think that there is a North and South issue here, right? A lot of uh, academics from the South will say to me, their research is not recognized. You know, their research is rejected as being, uh, they're not published. They're not uh, recognized as being good. Um, and they suffer quite a lot of distress from this. Um, we have, you know, if the world were, as you say, what we're trying to work towards is um, allowing people to set different agendas to bring different voices to the table um, that in the survival of the fittest of ideas, there isn't a monopoly of wisdom of um, traditional gatekeepers to um, you know, top journals who, who determine who gets published or not, who determines what voices get responded to and which ones are just die slowly and frozen out in the silence. Um, so I think, we just have to work much, much harder at understanding and listening to people because they won't necessarily respond to anything that we recognize because they're putting new things on the agenda. And I can I can I finish by saying I'm really delighted to hear from um, both the other speakers, but particularly Dr. Joe Ray, because you know I've always wondered about you Australians paying respect to unceded land and so on. And I'm thinking. That's pretty shocking, really. I have to say, my initial reaction is always, where's the meaningful restitution? I don't think it means much to, 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 to Indigenous people to, to, have you, to hear you say, yes, we stole your land. Yes, it's unceded. Yes, we're staying on it. We pay respect to you. That's it. You just get the verbal acknowledgement, but we're not giving you any, we're not doing anything meaningful in terms of restitution. So I heard her talk about restitution, and I can't help but say what uh, strikes an outsider um, every time these, these, when I go to something in Australia and somebody, you know, recites this mantra. And I think, how do Indigenous people respond to this? It's pretty in, infl inflammatory, I'd have thought. <laughs> Sorry, but, just to throw a grenade in there. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. That's absolutely um, what we're trying to work, walk towards um, is, you know, first of all, recognising what the difference is between an acknowledgement and a welcome and that they're, they're not the same thing. And then to recognise that if you are welcomed onto country, you are, it's like walking into somebody's house. When you are invited to someone's home, you don't trash the place. You, you pay respect to the people who have invited you there. If, if the owners are lucky, you might get a gift. But the point is that it, this is our home. This is our place of belonging, our caring as such. The responsibility of those who are welcomed is to walk softly and respectfully and listen, and I think listening is really important, and to actually be respectful. And that's how good relationships happen. So whether it's at the uh, acknowledgement and welcome level of life, or whether it's you go down for a bushwalk down the hill, and you actually listen to the birds, you smell the perfume, 
you actually open yourself to a relationship with place and the presences there so that they can impact you. And that's what we call Nura or country um, giving to us. We, there is a, a millions of um, anecdotal evidence to say mental health, physical well-being in the city is totally supported when you have natural bushland around you and you can actually go and get some peace from the human-centric, mad, congested city life that outside of COVID, we normally have to survive. And so it's not just blah to talk about relationship with places and presences. It's about surviving and breathing in and, and actually healing. We have eucalyptus in this, this continent. Eucalyptus is a is a internationally renowned healing agent. And we go into the bush and we can breathe it in. These these grounded realities actually are at the heart of relationships. And so that education path that we have to, because my generation, I was taught that there were no Aboriginal people in Sydney. They'd all died out or they, they were all out in central desert place. And so therefore this was an empty space. And it was only, you know, a few years ago that it was recognised that the, the, the continent of Australia was not terra nullius. There was actually relationships there. So, so this sense of um, having to educate people every step along the way um, to understand that, that you too need to care for your local area, your local country, your um, your local river, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right. I think now it's already three minutes past nine uh, forty-five p.m. here in Australia, and uh, I mean we could go on, and it's, it's such a fascinating panel. And I can see there are still questions in the chat box and in, in the Q and A. But I must wrap up here. And also, as I always said, and you know, uh, we here at the Center for Environmental Law, we we constantly organize different kind of uh, events. That our panel today will end here, but our dialogue continues. And I think for those who are asking questions, you are more than welcome to uh, reach out to our uh, wonderful presenters uh, directly, or oh, Sarah can help. So uh, with this, uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Joe, Mindy, and Dina for your wonderful, wonderful uh, presentations tonight. And also thank you for all those attendees, the 22 attendees who uh, stayed with us till the end. And uh, I'm feeling, I I'm now feeling very inspired and uh, I don't know whether I can sleep or uh, tonight but anyway I think I will start stop, stop here and uh, thank you bye-bye thank you